Ready to go? <clears throat> Thank you guys for coming. Um, today I'm going to be talking about Janus Graph. I think you probably all know where you are. Um, a little bit about me. My name is Taylor Getz. Um, I'm on the technical staff at Hortonworks, and I'm also a technical steering committee member for Janus Graph. Um, other Apache projects, I'm the PMC chair for Apache Storm, uh, an ASF member, and I'm also on the PMC for a, a bunch of other Apache projects. So how many people here are familiar with, our, with what a graph database is? Most of you. How many are using a graph database currently? Okay, a couple. That's good. So some of this is going to be review for you. Um, but if you look at the Wikipedia uh, definition for what a graph database is, um, it talks about graph structures, nodes, edges, and properties, and mainly relationships um, that allow data in the store to be linked together directly, and in many cases retrieved in one operation. So speed is an important property of graph databases. So to go into graph structures a little bit, um, vertices in a graph are the nodes or points in a graph structure. So if you're thinking of like a social graph, the vertices would be users. And then vertices can also be associated with a set of properties, and that's what makes a, a graph database a property graph database. And properties are essentially just uh, key value pairs. Edges in a graph are the connections between the vertices in a graph. And edges can be both directional, non-directional, or bidirectional. And like vertices, they can have properties. So in this case, we have um, sort of like a social graph structure um, where we have people following each other, and then a property on that edge is what year they began following someone. And then the graph itself is a collection of vertices, edges, and associated properties in the graph. So then what is a graph database? A graph database is a database that's optimized for storing and querying graph structures. And that's distinct from relational databases, which um, in relational databases to model a, a graph, um, you would, would involve joining lots and lots of tables together. And it's not very um, performant in that, in that sense. And the focus is on terms of storage and queries on relationships. So what are some of the, the common use cases of graph databases? Basically, anywhere where relation, relationship modeling and analysis of those relationships can provide insight or value. So one of the most obvious use cases of graph databases is in social media. Um, so in this, it's a very basic example, um, but you have people that have relationships with one another. Um, people who are friends, people who follow each other on social media or Twitter. Um, you have a person that may write about a certain subject, and then you may have uh, a person that's interested in that subject, and the value that you get from that is being able to analyze those relationships and get more insight about uh, the, the entities in the graph. Another use case that um, I was involved with um, in a recent job is master data management. Um, so in this case, and this is a very simplified um, example, but the idea is that you have an entity, and that entity has various properties. Um, and in master data management, you may be pulling in data from tons of different sources from all over the place um, for attributes of that entity. So their name, their address, their occupation. Um, and that, that relationship or the, the data 
So like occupation may come from different sources, and some sources may be more reliable than other sources. So with the graph database, you can add a rank attribute to the relationship and then choose which source um, you want to use for that occupation based on the, the rank of the, um, the source. So that allows you to put together what in, um, in MDM is sometimes called a golden record, which is like the ultimate truth about an entity. Other use cases include fraud detection, cybersecurity, identity and access management, um, recommendation engines, and all of these things can, can overlap and provide new insights. So if you think, about, if I go back to the um, social network and master data management pieces, one of the things we did, um, we essentially had a database that was all the healthcare practitioners in the United States. Um, and we used graphs to figure out what's the, what's the current state, what's the current golden record. Um, and then we expanded on that to go into, uh, to start mining social networks to pull in additional information, like going to LinkedIn or Salesforce or something like that, and um, linking those, those people not only, not only to their, the origin of their, their attributes and information, um, but also their relationships, like what hospital are they affiliated with, what health insurance companies are they affiliated with, that sort of thing. Um, and with fraud detection and cybersecurity, there'll be, there could be some overlap there. Um, identity and access management um, can also overlap with social networks. Recommendation engines also overlap there. Um, your friend may like this product, and based on your relationship with that friend, uh, we could maybe recommend that product to you. So the value in a, a graph database is really about the power of relationships. So it's, it's about harnessing the interconnectedness of data and through that finding paths to um, new revelations, new insights. Um, I talked about uh, querying. In, with graph databases, when you query the graph, it's called traversal, um, whereas a, a traditional SQL query um, is quite different. So one of the benefits there is um, that I mentioned a little bit earlier, is that you reduce the number of joins. So you don't have this massive SQL query. You just have a, a very simple query that says, tells you how to traverse the graph. And also with graph databases, um, a lot of times, if you can put it on a whiteboard and draw arrows and stuff, you can graph it. Whereas if you're dealing with a relational database, you graph it out on the, um, on the whiteboard, and then you have to go back and figure out all your entity, entity relationships, um, foreign keys, that sort of thing, and then you get that, that join explosion that I mentioned earlier. So before I get into the details of Janus Graph, I wanna um, talk about a little history um, of Titan Database, which is what became Janus, Janus Graph. TitanDB was a large-scale graph database developed by a company called Aurelius. Um, and it was originally, when it was open source, licensed under the Apache license version 2. And I'll get in, into why that's important a little later. Um, Aurelius was acquired by Datastax in February of 2015. And then later on that year, the finally 1.0 release of TitanDB was released in September. So if we look at the GitHub contributions to Titan over the years, you see a pretty healthy up and down, and then you see a little blip when Datastax acquires Aurelius. And then following that, you see a big uptick in um, community involvement leading up to the 090 maintenance release in June. Another little period of inactivity and then 1.0 was finally released in September of 2015. And then after that, the cricket arrives. So there's not much going on. Well, there, there's involvement in the community, but um, pull requests aren't being closed, and new development just doesn't seem to be 
um, taking place. So what, where does that leave the community and users? Um, when are those pull requests going to get merged? What about if there are new security vulnerabilities? Next version, that sort of thing. Um, so the, the community was there, but Datastax was not um, putting development effort back into the project. And that's where the Apache license version 2 comes into, into play. So I, I can't criticize Datastax for, um, for not continuing development with Titan. What they did, they decided they wanted to take ideas from Titan and create Datastax Enterprise Graph. And they had every right to do that. They bought the, um, well, they, they bought the company that produced, originally produced Titan. Um, but it really left the, the community out hanging. And that's one of the things that's great about the Apache license is that it, part of the, the impetus behind it is to empower communities to be able to take code and continue on a community um, without it being shut down if one particular company decides to pull all their resources from a project. So that's when we decided we can do this. We're, we're allowed to under the Apache license. We can take it and continue development and move the community someplace else. So our first thought was let's go to the Apache incubator and incubate it as an, an Apache project. We originally came up with the, the name Apache Olympian um, we completed the um, proposal process and we're already, we began the discussion phase of whether or not we're going to be able to incubate at Apache. And before I go on to what happened next, um, I need to sort of explain what a hostile fork is. And this is, this is my definition, but a hostile fork is a fork of a project that goes against the wishes of the copyright holders and or the community. So in this case, the, the community was there. They were ready. They, they wanted to know when was the next version, when's the next version going to come out? Can you close my pull requests? Can you, you know, where are we going? So the community was there, but the copyright holder wasn't. So we had talks with Datastax, or had um, approached them and said, um, would you have any, any problem with us taking this to Apache? And again, the cricket returned. Um, so they weren't on board, but they weren't blocking it. And we were moving forward in the discussion phase. And then this bomb kind of dropped. So the Datastax Council said on the incubator mailing list, Datastax does not approve of and objects to the proposed forking of Titan into Olympian or any other ASF project. So one thing about Apache, it's sort of an unwritten rule that they don't accept um, hostile forks. So that was the end of the road at Apache. Um, so from there, we regrouped, and we went to the Linux Foundation. And that's where Janus Graph is today. So Janus Graph was spearheaded by Google, IBM, Hortonworks, Xperia, and Graken AI. And we currently have con contributions from Netflix, Amazon, Uber, and orchestral development. And as I mentioned before, it's sponsored by the, the Linux Foundation. Um, it's Apache license version 2. And we follow very similar, um, because a lot of the people um, involved with the project are familiar with Apache and or are committers on Apache projects. Um, so we decided to go with that governance model. Uh, source codes on GitHub, mailing lists on Google Groups, and we have chat on Gitter. So let's get into some of the technical details. So Janus Graph is optimized for storing and querying billions and billions of vertices and edges, and thousands of concurrent users and uh, transactions. You can execute local queries or cross-cluster distributed queries on Janus Graph. Um, Janus Graph implements the Tinkerpop API, which in my opinion is one of, is sort of the framework, um, an API for graph manipulation and traversal. Um, it's open source, it's an Apache project, it's been a top level project for I think about a year and a half now. Um, a number of 
graph databases supported like Neo4j and a couple of others. Um, and it helps promote portability. So if you program your application to the Tinkerpop APIs, you can move it, you can swap out different graph, graph databases with, uh, with a fair amount of ease. Janus Graph uses the Gremlin query language, which is part of the Tinkerpop API. Um, Gremlin's a DSL for graph traversal and ma manipulation. It has a fluent API and multiple languages. So you can program it in Java, Scala, Groovy, Python, um, whatever language you like. For OLAP integration, Janus Graph supports Apache Hadoop, Apache Spark, and Apache Giraffe. Is ACID compliant, depending on the back end, um, and I'll get into back ends a little bit later. Um, it's either gonna be ACID or eventual consistency. Uh, it supports many concurrent transaction, and it can be embedded into like a single node app, um, or you can scale out in a distributed environment um, with the different back end options. This is an architectural overview. Um, so on the left for OLAP, you have Gremlin Graph Computer, which is part of the Tinkerpop stack. And that provides the integration with um, Spark, Hadoop, and Giraffe. And then that speaks to the OLAP and I.O. interface of Janus Graph. Then on the um, old TP side, there's a management API for manipulating the database itself, um, some of the management functions and then for actually um, traversing and modifying the graph, uh, the main interface there is Gremlin. Then there are the internal APIs, um, data and transa transaction management and optimization, and then there's the decoupled indexing and, and backend storage API. And right now, some of the, some of the original storage backends were HBase, Cassandra, and Berkeley DB, and then for external index backends, we had Elasticsearch, Solar, and Lucene. And some of those are expanding, as you'll see. So the storage backend has a, a well-defined API that allows you to easily plug in new implementations. And the nice thing about that is it lets you pick the backend that's best for your use case and your, your application architecture. Um, right now, originally, we supported HBase, Cassandra, and Berkeley DB, we've added uh, Google Cloud Bigtable, um, and a couple another, few others are on their way as well. Another benefit of that is, I imagine most of you are familiar with the CAP theorem. Um, it allows you to pick where on the um, CAP triangle you want to want to be. So if you can, if you're okay with eventual consistency. Um, and you're looking for partition tolerance and availability, you can go with Apache Cassandra or Scylla. Um, and if you can sacrifice a little availability, um, you can get partition tolerance and consistency with Apache HBase. Um, Berkeley DB is a, a little different um, because unlike all the other um, databases on this slide, Berkeley DB is a, um, it's not distributed. So that's the case where you're embedding it into a single node or a single application. Um, external indices. This is where the index storage comes into play. What they are is it's secondary to the primary storage, and it's completely optional, but what it does is provides a mean to speed up graph traversal um, and inf information retrieval. Uh, there are two types. There's graph index and vertex-centric index. Graph indices are global index structures across the entire graph. Um, and they allow for efficient retrieval of vertices and edges based on properties. And what that does is eliminates the need to scan the whole graph. But luckily, Janus Graph is smart enough, if you do something like that, if you write a query that isn't using indexes, it will, it will warn you that, we're, hey, we're scanning the whole database. Um, you should probably throw some indexes on it so we don't do that. Um, New indexes take effect immediately, um, but in some cases, for example, um, when, you, when you have existing data 
and you want to add indexes to it, you may need to um, re-index, but there's a process for that. Vertex-centric cent ind indices are, uh, those are local, in local index structures as opposed to global, so they don't affect the, whole, the entire graph. And what that does, like the global indexes, is it eliminates the need to load all the vertices for filtering. Backends we currently support. Um, originally, um, only Elasticsearch and Lucene were supported, but now with Janusgraph, we're um, including Apache Solar. Um, and there might be a few more on the, on the road as well. Um, Janusgraph supports optional schema. Um, schemas consist of edge labels, property keys, and vertex labels, essentially all the different pieces in the graph, they can be explicit or implicit. So you can either say, okay, this is my, this is the schema for my graph, or you can just start creating a graph. And if you start creating a graph, um, it will create an implicit schema, um, but in that case, it's usually very loosely typed, um, so it doesn't really get in the way. And you can evolve schemas over time, so you can change the schema without having to, to take your database offline. Some of the, the schema um, components include edge label multiplicity, property keys, key cardinality, and vertex labels, and I'll get into the, each one of those. So, so edge label multiplicity is about how many, how many edges you can have with the same label going between two nodes. Um, so multi is wide open. You can have as many uh, connect edges or connections with the same label to as many number of nodes as you want. Uh, simple is sort of the opposite. You can have one unique la label between two nodes. And then many to one is where you have an outgoing edge with that label. Um, an example of that is a mother-child relationship. So children can only have one mother, but mothers can have many children. And then the inverse of that is one-to-many, where you have one incoming edge with one label. And then one-to-one -one is pretty self-explanatory, one outgoing edge with that label. One incoming, one outgoing. Uh, property key data types. So each property has a name and then a value, and the key data type is um, what that value type is. So we support, most of these are pretty standard. One of the more interesting one is GeoShape, um, which is, allows you to do geospatial queries or spatial queries um, in your graph. Then property key cardinality. Um, this is how many values you could have for a particular key. So single, you can have one key per value. So an example of that is last name. So a person only has, can only have one last name. Then a list is just an arbitrary list that allows for duplicates. And a set can have multiple values but no duplicates. <clears throat> so I mentioned Gremlin earlier. Um, Janus Graph and the Tink Tinkerpop stack ship with what's called the Gremlin console, and that's a Groovy-based REPL, REPL for exploring the graph. Um, and it includes a couple predefined global variables that can be extended by plugins. For example, um, and I'll talk more about, and I'll show examples of um, Gremlin traversals, but G is usually your starting point. That's a predefined variable that represents the entire graph. Um, then there's the um, Hadoop plugin, and with that enabled, you'll have access to an HDFS variable that um, gives you access to the HDFS file system that you're connected to. And Gremlin can be local or remote. You can very easily spin up a local um, Janus Graph instance just to play around with data, um, or you can connect to a remote database instance, or even a, a Gremlin server serving another 
uh, graph database backend. So when you initially load the um, Gremlin console, this is what it looks like. Um, so you can see here it loaded the Hadoop plugin, so it's going to give you access to the HDFS variable and a couple others. Um, and then it also activated the Janus Graph plugin, which gives you some Janus Graph specific um, variables that you can work with. So this is the graph of the gods. This is a, a simple data set that ships with Janus Graph for being able to, to play, around, play around with graph traversals. Um, so basically it's a, a graph of the Roman gods and their various relationships and attributes. So if we're gonna, let's say we're gonna query it, we wanna know who is Hercules' grandfather. So we'd load the Gremlin console and type G, that will select the entire graph. Then we do the V function and that will select all the vertices in the graph. Next, we want to find the vertex, and this is, this is our starting point. We want to find the vertex that has, the, has a name property with the value of Hercules. Then we want to traverse the edge called father from that. So we're going from Hercules to his father, Jupiter. Then we do that again to select Jupiter's father. So we've now selected Saturn. We select the name of that, the name property of that vertices. And finally, it outputs Saturn. So that's just a simple example, but there, there are many other, the um, gremlin language is Turing complete, and there, there are many things you can do with it um, in terms of filtering and uh, traversing various parts of the graph. So what's an inversion number? So last we left uh, TitanDB, it was at 1.1 one, one snapshot, and that's where we started when we moved Janus Graph to uh, the Linux Foundation. The most recent Janus Graph release was 0.1.1. Don't let the, the low version number fool you. Um, it's used in production already by a number of companies um, and is, is pretty mature. Contributions are welcome. Um, here's a link to our website, um, our organization on GitHub, uh, our user mailing list and developer mailing lists on uh, Google Groups. And with that, that's it. We also have another uh, TSC member here with us who knows a lot of the technical details and was involved in the whole process. So if there's anything I can't answer, I'm sure he can. I won't ask Jason to stand up. He can just. <laughs> Any questions? Good. Mm -hmm. Um, Janus, the, the question is, um, what are the Neo4j versus Janus Graph? What are the um, benefits of Janus Graph over? I don't have any benchmarks offhand, but um, the whole the architecture is different. Whereas um, Janus Graph gives you a bunch of different plugins, um, so you can tailor it to your use case a little easier in terms of storage backends. Um, and From a scalability, scalability. Um, and Neo4j sort of followed, Jason um, explained it pretty well. Um, from the very beginning, Titan and now Janus Graph was designed for distributed computing. Um, some of the single node stuff were add-ons that just make it simple for single node deployments. Um, or just debugging, testing, unit testing, and that sort of thing. Um, whereas Neo4j sort of went the opposite direction. Um, Neo4j is a lot older. Um, 
And so they went from non-distributed and started adopting some of the distributed pieces. So Genesis essentially more than a draft of Git engine, right? It was a database. Yes, with that underlying storage. So um, you're you're not going to query the underlying storage directly. You're going to go through the the API layers. Though you could if you want to, but you'd probably want to use Janoscribe to do that anyway. Did you have a question? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so uh, thank you for the talk. It was pretty good. Um, one thing that I did not quite understand is that how do you run a distributed compute? You did speak about Spark and all that. Mm -hmm. But the example that you show, uh, no, Gremlin. So I'm trying to understand how you actually do a distributed compute job. Or is that's, it purely Spark, or does Janus Graph have any role in that? That's, that's where the Tinkerpop plugins come into play. So when you use those, you'll be handed, you'll essentially be handed um, parameters that allow you to access the graph. Um, similar to, to the example where um, in Gremlin console, you have that G global variable like that, only they'll be in your, your Spark jobs and MapReduce jobs. Um, for now, I would go to the Janus Graph um, website, janusgraph.org. Um, it's you can curl the distribution and then have a Gremlin console up in a minute with the Graph of the Gods, and you can figure out who Hercules's grandfather is. Are we out of time? Oh, I, just one other question. If you have a graph that relies heavily on things like edge-based statistics and incrementing, uh, incrementing uh, properties on edges, you know, are there any particular ways that uh, Janus Graph either supports this or looks to support this? Uh, and how does that compare to other graph solutions like Gaffer, for example, or the Accumulo-based uh, graph databases? So you're, you're talking about incrementing? So like graphs a, that focus heavily on edge-based statistics. So uh, things like incrementing counts of a relation uh, between entities in a graph. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, cybersecurity would be a good use case. Uh, exactly. yeah, a number of packets between two nodes. Uh, yeah, are there any particular areas where Janus can be improved, uh, or yeah, how does that compare to other edge statistic-focused graph databases like GAFA, for instance? Um. Trying to, f I don't know if I understand your question entirely. Um, so you're talking about how can you optimize? Yeah, so optimizing compute and increment of properties on edges, essentially. You can, you would do that with um, indexes. So indexes and schemas. So you would define which which properties are numeric and incrementable, right? And then from there, uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have a great answer for you right now because I don't fully understand your, your question. Sorry. Okay. Do you see um, Hortonworks including Janus Graph in its uh, distribution? Um, it will be, um, but indirectly, uh, because it's used like by um, things like Atlas and Metron. So it's there. So if you if you wanted to use it, you could. Uh, there's very less of information about how do you load a large scale data that is existing into um, into a Janus graph kind of database. What's the best practices and there's, uh, what to follow and things. So there's a tool called a bulk loader which will, can bulk load oh, graph sorry. databases. And you can also you could also do something like a MapReduce or a Spark job to load it. 
The question is, are there plans to include it as part of the stack? Uh, what stack? Um, like, I, I don't know if it'll become um, something that's officially supported, um, but it is, like I said, it is part of the stack because it's included by other pieces of the stack. One more. Is there documentation? Um, they're, in my experience, they're roughly similar, um, but they have different, um, different characteristics based on the technology underneath, right? So like um, Cassandra's eventually consistent, um, HBase isn't. So, um, and again, it's going back to that cap triangle um, and also, yeah, just look at the, the, um, the characteristics really rely on what you have configured as the underlying data storage. Yeah, that's a, a fairly common use case. And again, it also depends on, um, so geo-searching depends on the indexing backend that you have configured. So some of them may not support it. Um, there's also, and um, I probably should have shown it, but I didn't, there's, when you log into Gremlin console, you can, um, you could do essentially like a describe graph, and it will show you all the features that are supported um, by what's currently configured in terms of backends and indexing. Okay, I think we're, time's up. Thank you again.